Hi, Morgan. Hello. How's it going? It's great. So good. good. <laughs> so good. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about who you are and what your business is, and then we'll jump in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I am a licensed clinical marriage and family therapist. Mm -hmm. um, I graduated and jumped right into private practice in 2021. Um, I have as like a marriage and family therapist, kind of like a systemic lens that I use when I'm working with my clients. So it's all about like the context and like what's going on in your family of origin, like the spaces between you and your relationships with other people, other things, your relationship with yourself. So it's like a very highly relational way of doing therapy. So I'm not going to be like your girl if you're like, let's do some like Freudian stuff. Like I literally, we didn't even cover that sort of stuff in our training program. So oh. it's like hyper focused on like the systems relational perspective and so that doesn't mean that I just work with like couples and families obviously sure. I think it's really useful to use that lens with individuals too um and that's like the typical client who would be like oh I want to go to therapy <laughs> you know yeah um, someone kind of on their own and it's just like hard to rally the troops and have yeah. everybody show up at the same time with schedules and you know so anyway I see kind of a broad range of people um so yeah that's awesome that's what I do I love that that's great that's why we work so closely and you're in our office um and so, I'm in there yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that that's helpful yeah. um but no I feel like a lot of the patients I refer to you or people <clears throat> that see you as kind of like people especially people navigating like life transitions is that oh for sure accurate especially if you're like adding a new family dynamic like postpartum or that's I feel like where yeah. ours um, yeah absolutely overlap. so there's there's like natural and normal struggle that's built into every human experience yeah. uh, and so those like life transitions are a major um, pressure point if that mm -hmm. makes sense and yeah. so it's like you're getting thrown into the, like this boiling pot anytime you're experiencing a significant whether it's like phase of life age of life transition or your family is like literally growing through marriage or having a kid adopting a kid and just like having the expanse or your like brother or sister they get married and then you're like now I got all these people to deal with <laughs> you know so I think um it's the increasing complexity shifts um our systems for how we interact with the yeah. world um and so by that we just need to adjust our approaches and our strategies that got us up to this current point yeah. may not be effective with this new development that you're now having to integrate and deal with and navigate and so there's pain <laughs> and there's like yeah. struggle associated with any form of change and so I think yeah I'm I'm really like lucky to get to kind of meet with clients in that space and be like hey like this is this isn't easy like you're right I'm glad you're <laughs> seeking someone to help you think through and take this transition seriously and do the best that you can do you know um so yeah Totally. Yeah. Okay, so tell us kind of then about like when you're, when you're navigating someone through that life transition, I'm sure there's like common themes like across the like general human experience or like things mm -hmm. that are kind of work for most people. Are there things that we, I don't know, either like common things that you see when people are navigating, like either adding someone to their family, like marriage, baby, whatever that may be, um, are there common things that you see people struggle with or that you feel like you, like, I don't know, little things you give them of like, oh, this is something helpful to help you navigate. I don't know if that is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a very broad question. I know. Sorry. But I think yeah. that's okay. So, um, <laughs> like catching that, I would say essentially, like my work with each client is like highly individualized based off of like sure. their way of seeing the world, their values, yeah. their experiences up to that point. So what will bother them the most about mm -hmm. the transition yeah. is, is independent. Yeah. But I think it's still a good question because like the, just the feeling of like frustration <laughs> and anger yeah. can be really shocking to a lot of people. And we also don't have like a whole lot of 
um, great ways of relating to those emotions in our culture. We like to be happy, positive vibes only, like all that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And so it can be really dysregulating. Like it actually adds more emotion because you're re you're having a negative emotional reaction to the emotion that you're actually feeling. Mm. And then it intensifies and worsens your experience of whatever you're going through. Um, so like, yeah, if you've got like this cute little newborn baby and you're also like, I'm freaking pissed. <laughs> like I don't have my body to myself. I don't have my time to myself. Like if you have all this anger and even rage, that's kind of like flowing through your veins <laughs> when you're supposed to be like this idyllic sweet mom. <laughs> It's, yeah. it can be really upsetting to people, you know, mm -hmm. um, or if like you, maybe someone didn't get married until like later in life, for example, and they're like looking forward to this. And then all of a sudden they get married and they're like trying to merge two independent autonomous people's lives into this shared space. And it's really frustrating <laughs> because yeah, you're same and you're going to fight about stuff and then you're getting upset because you're upset, if that makes sense. So I think a lot of work that we end up doing with clients is like distress tolerance and learning mm -hmm. to uh, acknowledge and welcome and allow for the full spectrum of human emotion uh, and yeah. all the different things that you'll feel as you go through each of these transitions because um, there's really no off switch. And I mean, even if there were, it kind of looks like depression. <laughs> it's not a great alternative. Like you're not going to escape frustration. Um, yeah. So helping people slow down, learn how to sit with it, learn how to move through it uh, is kind of like a universal practice. <laughs> that totally. I think, uh, yeah. Really helpful. <clears throat> no, that makes a lot of sense. And I think just, I mean, <clears throat> half the time it's just like knowing that it's normal or like it's common mm -hmm. in general to go through yes. those things. Yeah, just like that feeling things. of like, oh, I'm not crazy. I'm not alone. Right. Just because I've had this crazy intrusive thought. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, like being like, what have I done with my life? Like, do I regret yeah. all my life choices <laughs> up to this point? Like those kind of like panicked feelings. I'm like, yeah, yeah like your brain is designed to keep you safe and to uh -huh. like, survive in a environment that is not very friendly all the time and so it's trying to scan the horizon for like danger and threat and reduce those and so if your brand new partner or your brand new baby is causing a lot of distress then like your brain's like is this a threat should we eliminate it we could <laughs> you know like there's like like that line of thinking is actually really like adaptive and like evolutionarily necessary obviously we need to meet with it and regulate it and make good choices <laughs> but yeah. um, that's the the fact that your brain goes there is like the most normal thing ever <laughs> super helpful to know even now you know <laughs> <laughs> so that's good I mean <clears throat> it makes sense because I often tell people when they're preparing for like labor and delivery that like fear and anxiety like in that moment um heightens the sensation of pain so mm -hmm. um I mean it makes sense of like knowing that there's pain I mean this is like kind of a big jump but like yeah knowing no, that pain I'm in that to moment, <laughs> knowing that there's pain in that moment and like kind of like being like yeah this is purposeful this is bringing me to my end goal or whatever um that can be mm -hmm. helpful in like your experience of pain so it's kind of right I mean if you're that... trying to escape labor the whole time you're in it you're really gonna right. have a terrible experience yes right <laughs> yes yeah so but it kind of I mean yeah it kind of tracks with just mm -hmm. you know life in general of like if you're trying to like escape the feelings all the time or escape you're like oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way it's just gonna like heighten in right. the background yeah yeah that panic really escalates things <laughs> yeah right totally so interesting so cool. So yeah, good. I'm giving the right advice then. <laughs> Perfect. We're doing great. Uh, okay. So kind of going back into like how might someone's like family of origin then impact the way that they kind of experience those moments or like in their current relationships. Yeah. I'll let you kind of take it from me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in every way <laughs> so yes <laughs> yes, yes yeah like there's the, this like nature versus nurture debate that's like fun mm -hmm. and entertaining and there's like a lot to both sides but I'm like 
nurture. <laughs> you know, like there's, they're both true, but there's so much of like our brain development and like formation that's impacted by our family of origin. Um, and you're saying the way that this impacts like your way of experiencing like current relationships or. Yeah. I mean, just the world or. Yeah, either, both. Yeah, I mean, I think we're kind of going down the track of, like, maybe um, adding something new to your family, so some... Yes, yes. Okay, so, I mean, just, like, a quick little super non-clinical language (laughs) crash course of, like, we are, we have, like, these mirror neurons in our brains where we're, like, copying and replicating what we experience, what we see around us, and so we're very much like socially formed creatures. Mm. Um, There's actually almost no possibility of having a self without community, without context. Like we need relationship to be able to know who we are. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I could talk about that for literally an hour, (laughs) like the details of like how that can play out um, through like isolation and different things like that. But I think, um, so yes, our experiences with like our primary relationships our family of origin growing up is teaching us so much of what to expect about what is normal in the world Mm -hmm. um because our normal is definitely not everyone else's (laughs) normal from family to family um and so it teaches us stuff about like gender role expectations it teaches us I mean we it determines whether or not we have developed emotional regulation skills it teaches us what sorts of things we should be afraid of and what sorts of things we should really value and how we should manage stressful situations. Like we are taught these things through a context, through a family or caregivers or wherever we were raised, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think pivoting that towards a transition that we were just saying is like marked by distress, (laughs) marked Mm -hmm. by challenge. Um, if we didn't have a family that taught us distress tolerance, resilience, um, that's going to be especially upsetting probably to our internal world to go through these transitions. Um, but then also if you're, you know, having a new baby and you're a, a nice fella who grew up in a family where your mom did everything, <laughs> oh. it's not, it's, you're not going to be very prepared for what does it look like for a man to support a woman in this caretaking dynamic and how do I show up and how do I be an equal parent in this system because it wasn't necessarily modeled for that person and so the way that you (laughs) orient yourself to this new transition and what your own personal expectations are of yourself your partner the rest of the family is going to be highly shaped by what we've seen already up to that point in our lives yeah I think we're seeing that a lot like in our generation of parents of Mm -hmm. like there's more equal workloads happening or hopefully Mm -hmm. happening (laughs) Um, yeah yeah we're and, recognizing that especially as like more and more women are continuing to be like working while also having kids it's like hey just like it's not like oh the working person doesn't have to do as much child care yeah. stuff because then it's like two jobs one job <laughs> like, yeah. we're all trying to do more than feels like we could ever keep up with yeah <laughs> so it takes a new structure a new system to be able to navigate this well yeah Yeah. So that kind of leads us into like maternal mental load um, and like what that kind of like is and um, how generally, I know you work with people like individually on how to like navigate that in their specific family, but if you have any like kind of like general like tips or like things to think about, that would be helpful. Yeah. And I mean, I do work with like a pretty decent amount of couples on this too um, yeah oh, I yeah. just had a few couples that like are taking a break <laughs> because they just had their baby and then I just had a couple I think it was yesterday come or no two days ago uh start back with their like little three week old and I was Aww. like dying because I'm like also pregnant and very hormonal so like, this cute. Is the cutest day of my life but so <laughs> um so navigating that transition as a couple um and recognizing the social um structure that kind of 
defaults to placing a lot on the mom for Mm -hmm. managing this transition. (laughs) And I would almost like say, yeah, that maternal mental load is like a managerial role um, that a lot of women, a lot of moms feel like they are primarily going it alone in that role not to say at all that like the male or the other partner is not wanting to be helpful they aren't actually doing anything that's not what the mental load is saying it's saying that there's this managerial like big picture organizational system that the mom feels like they're designing and executing alone. So even though the partner may be doing just as much externally, behaviorally to caretake and run systems, um, the forethought and the planning and the packing of the bags and, you know, and the calculation of the ounces of breast milk that have been digested that day, like that sort of stuff pretty regularly falls into the female caretaker's camp. So yeah the way that we for the second half of that question is like yeah. the way sorry that I we asked try to reduce <laughs> you know to try to like reduce that experience because the fact that one person is primarily taking charge isn't like necessarily the problem because it can be highly functional you know so we don't want to like say oh well this is all bad we got to never let moms have maternal mental load, (laughs) but depending on your specific family and what you guys need, there may be some conversations that are called for of like, Hey, depending on the experience that -hmm. the woman is having of that mental load, we can adjust it. We can invite our partners in to all the things that are happening inside of our brain (laughs) before we ever say a word (laughs) at the beginning of the day. Um, we can invite them into that and nine times out of 10, our partners want to feel helpful. They like us. <laughs> they want to participate in relieving stress and anxiety and in being like a meaningful part of the caretaking system. Um, I think a lot of times it's it goes two ways where it's like sometimes women will um, or the mom will have like a lot of pride and like specificity on how they want things executed they don't actually want a (laughs) co-manager sure I get that they won't do everything the exact same way and that can be frustrating so I think there's this internal battle that a mom has to face before they're willing to go do that external battle with their partner of like do I actually want my partner to be in charge in an equal way of managing all these moving pieces because If not, then I can actually feel a lot more peace about this part of the responsibility of home management (laughs) that I've chosen to take this leadership role in. Um, But if not, if you're like, dude, no, I don't care. I just need them to like help, like I'm I'm dying. Then that's a really great entryway for being able to invite someone into like, hey, I need you to maybe just like be the laundry person that like knows that laundry exists <laughs> and like you're tracking, you're paying attention. You're noticing the baskets fill up. You're noticing the decreasing amount of toddler shorts that are available. Like that would be so cool <laughs> if you could tune into that and just be like, that's my job. Um, so it can be really specific with how you actually end up spreading out that management mm-hmm. that happens in your brain. Um yeah, you almost have to have that battle with yourself first of like, am I going to nitpick and then treat my partner like a kid in the way that they're choosing to manage? Is it like, come on, buddy, help me cut the fruits and vegetables, you know, and here's your, you know, toddler tower to do it. Or is it like, you're in charge, see you when you're done, you know, like which posture are you willing to assume in the way that you relate to your partner? So (laughs) yeah, if, if you're willing to release some of those like elements of control um then that's that's very very possible to reduce that mental load yeah that makes sense um and that's helpful I think sometimes too I have just my own experience of navigating that a little bit is um it's interesting like even Mm -hmm. like the better I get at like releasing some Mm -hmm. of these things and being like okay you're in charge of this like um the I feel like it's easy to start feeling and my husband doesn't feel this but the like mom guilt 
factor oh, of yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know my daughter going to my husband for things like in public especially for whatever reason like it doesn't bother me at home <laughs> but like in public when she's like dad I need my snack or whatever instead of me and then like someone notices or whatever which is a great thing I mean it's like so helpful but I just those like little moments where you're like oh my gosh am I like not present enough? or like I'm like then analyzing like oh why didn't she come to me or whatever which I know this is what I've worked for <laughs> this is what I put in all the time and effort for yes yes yeah, so, so that's the that internal battle that you yes. have to, like, keep fighting you don't just fight it once <laughs> yeah exactly so it's just interesting to then <clears throat> like I do think sometimes it's like a guilt thing too of like you're like mm-hmm. I'm supposed to be the person in um in that role or like society expects that of me or whatever that may be um yeah yeah so interesting but no and I mean like you're not my client so <laughs> yeah <laughs> we don't have me. to go there no. <laughs> but I'm just curious like it yeah. like for personal reflection and yeah. I'm saying it's not specifically for you but for other people that also feel this yeah. way like getting curious about your own mom you oh, know yeah, totally <laughs> what what role did they play am I trying to be them in ways that are maybe not possible because like for me like I had a stay-at-home mom who literally homeschooled all of us Mm -hmm. like that's a lot of like mental load that she opted into right and she was the go-to for like 90 percent of the things you know and so but I I work and I'm a mom so there's like this difference in like practicality of like what one person can or should manage And so, yeah, I'd just be curious of like, what did you experience from your mom growing up? And then I'd also like look at what is going on with moms who are like peers or even just like one, one, you know, 10 year gap above us. Like what's going on with them that you admire and want to like emulate yourself? Interesting. Because if the primary people that you are comparing yourself to are on social media it's time to flush your toilet your phone down the toilet you know like <laughs> but if there's like if there's like real real actual moms who you're like yeah. yes we have similar lives we have similar values and I just feel like man I'm just not measuring up then there's like room for vulnerability and growth there does that make sense so totally. it's almost such a like tiered thing of like hold on <laughs> like am I holding myself yeah. to these standards that I'm not even fully aware of that I'm subscribing to and if I am, how do I start to like release that and just be like, oh, there's that, there's that mom guilt, but I don't have to panic about the mom guilt. I can just know that this is a normal feeling yeah. as I grow and evolve <laughs> and just be like, oh, there it is, you know, and kind of let it move through you. Um, but again, if it's like, man, no, I really think I'm like missing something here and I'm mm. like, talk to like a real mom <laughs> that you actually know and respect because yeah. they'll kind of maybe give you some life hacks. <clears throat> And I'm sure there's no parent who's got it all perfectly together, but why not seek growth if you've gone through these different processes and you're like, do I feel, I still feel like there's something missing, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really good. I didn't even, yeah. I definitely think about like, oh, my mom was stay at home. That's probably why, but it's, it's yeah. Interesting to, it all comes back to those mirror neurons, right? (laughs) There we are. Yeah. Love it. (laughs) We talk about those in PT all the time. It's funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, even yeah. like your kids, like you're supposed to like copy what they're doing and kind of mirror it back to them. And so it's just so interesting. Oh yeah. I was thinking even more from like in almost like an athletic perspective. Oh yeah, like for sure. Younger siblings. I think it's yep. the thing that they tend to be a little more athletic. I'm like, well, yeah. they're cheating. They're watching they're the cheating. older kids, to, like the older kids struggle and trip and fall. And they're like, well, I'm not doing that. And then they yeah. like show up and they're walking yeah. earlier than everyone else. And they're like getting awards in soccer totally. or whatever. So yeah, I know I won't, I, I'll try not to go too far into it, but with stroke patients, it's like a whole tre- treatment technique with like the mirror in between their hands and then like the hand that's not mobile you like your brain watches the mirror so when you move this hand then your brain thinks this hand is moving and then Ooh. that and it like works like your breaking, brain breaking then, the mirror neurons with mirrors yeah literally a mirror so smart I love this 
so interesting. It's like wild that it works because you're like, Wait. <laughs> you just literally tricked your brain and you like know what's happening. And your brain's like, yeah. oh yeah, now we can move both hands. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's like different parts of your brain. Like one part of your brain is smarter in that way. Yeah. Than <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so wild. So, well, wow, those mirror neurons, so cool. Um, I guess, are there things... I feel like there's so much on social media now and I see it with like moms especially like that's where we're going to like get information and there is like I put information out on social media a lot and I do notice that like when I put something out on social media that's like a little bit more like black and white or like um like never do kegels or something like that it gets way more interaction than something that's like neutral or like more um like makes more sense probably like this is when an appropriate time yeah nuance is not um right by the algorithm yeah right so I just think about that and then like especially like mental health and therapy is like definitely getting more talked about which is great but I'm assuming that you see a lot of the same things of like just like this like very black and white of like you should or shouldn't do this yeah do you yeah it's just very frustrating (laughs) yeah 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 um are there like ways you see that like negatively or positively playing into like the new family dynamic um the what we are having access to on social media yeah or like if you're just seeing a common theme in your clients sorry I don't know all the nuances since I'm not in your sessions but like I guess what do you yeah or just like social media in general with that new family dynamic how that like impacts yes so anything any thought that has ever existed will exist on social media (laughs) you know like the the content that you could come across it spans the whole whole human experience you know Mm -hmm. so there's going to be almost like this filter that you're going to have to put and again this is like this I'm myself using strong language right now but you have to put this filter but like I just think it would be beneficial (laughs) to have a way of filtering content that you take as oh this is good advice and this is someone's experience you know there's a difference between tuning in to you on Wellcore, like, and you're talking about something really specific Mm. that's evidence-based and research-backed and it's really helpful information versus a mom who's very well-meaning maybe, you know, but they're like, this is how we sleep trained and this is the best way. And it worked for all three of my kids and it will work for you, girly. (laughs) Like, okay. That's the worst. (laughs) So happy for you and your sleep training journey (laughs) or whatever, but that, um, that creates this sense of like panic and feeling overwhelmed, overstimulated because that confidence, whatever that mom goes into to try to educate you and help you, there's a mom that's doing the exact opposite somewhere mm-hmm. else and everything in between. <laughs> you know, So it's completely paralyzing to a parent to be able to navigate these things and have confidence in their own instincts and like gut reactions and knowing yeah. their own kid because rather than And I like believe this really strongly, like rather than attuning to your specific kid and being curious about how they respond to things, you're attuning to social media and these influencers or even clinicians, like, you know, you're attuning to them and what they're trying to tell you is best for your kid. And I really believe that we have like some really like deep instincts in our gut that are worth staying connected to. Maybe not you know, every single emotion we ever feel is true. (laughs) That's not what I'm suggesting. But I think when we like have an instinct of like, this doesn't feel right or something's off with this and like, or my kid is like responding very poorly (laughs) to this thing. (laughs) It's maybe I shouldn't just like power through because they say it'll work eventually, you know, like it's okay to adjust and to do what you think is actually best for your family. And so if I were to just summarize all of that, it's essentially like, I think the mass of information can be really paralyzing and disconnect us from like our intuition because we're just absorbing way too much information and executing on very little that's actually connected to your family and what they need if that makes sense oh it makes total sense mm-hmm. I mean <clears throat> something one of the doulas said that I interviewed that like has stuck with me and kind of reminds me even of just like this conversation that like 
each kid is a little bit different too. Yeah. And I've had, I've had like a couple first time moms, which like, I love this. And I'm always like, best of luck, <laughs> but they're like, they're first time moms. And they're like, I think I'm just going to like act like a second time mom. And I'm like, I love that for you. I wish I that was great. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I think that it's harder, you know, than you think, but I do. I like the spirit of like being like, I'm going to just like focus on my kid and not like try and take all of these things. But what I was going to say is a doula said something about like part of like even just like your birth experience or like your first experience with your child like in labor and delivery and like how confident you feel kind of in yourself in those moments like really sets up kind of your not forever but like your first (laughs) definitely like initial confidence in like being a parent like if you felt like empowered to like make decisions about your body or like you felt listened to and heard and like I I just it was like mind-blowing to me because I was just like oh my gosh I see that so much in those like initial moments or like um when people feel like they have a lot of information going into I don't know it's like the balance right like you have a lot of information but you're not like overly like (laughs) panicked about every little thing but you feel confident listening to yourself and knowing that you have like the resources and tools to make yes obviously yeah not (laughs) anti-research no 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 totally yeah but it's like the it is that like how do I take in and integrate things that are like very very solid that I can trust rather than like trying to take in and integrate everything (laughs) so um it does contribute to that sense of like being like stable prepared of like I have some clues this is why like birthing classes and like all these different ways of prepping with you and your partner for that experience are like massively helpful because Mm -hmm. like if you run into something during the process of labor and it's like I've literally never even heard of the words that are coming out of this doctor's mouth before (laughs) you know like this is so scary, you know, um, that can definitely impact your posture. Cause you're like, wow, like I thought I got it. And then I didn't. And then, you know, so it can kind of be stabilizing. But one thing you're saying though, about like the empowerment and the way that that impacts like moving forward, um, so much of long before we enter into a season of motherhood or pregnancy, like our sense of whether or not we have power in the world was formed by our families of origin (laughs) like ta-da like that is so huge for us feeling like we belong we can take up space so I would almost suggest that like yes absolutely education is huge but what actually helps you know a new mom for example move forward and grow into a space of empowerment isn't just information it's relationship like you were describing like the experience of being empowered by other people in the room and that's what actually moved that mom into believing that she had power (laughs) you know so I'm like you could read a book and be like wow I'm so powerful and then like but if that's not a felt experience totally in in your relationships then you're not really gonna have a lot of success shifting, you know? And so that's where I'm like, yay, love relational therapy because it is practicing new ways of experiencing ourselves in relationship to the world, in relationship to other people. And so, yeah, that's a huge, huge deal to be able to set up people with information for sure. But the experience- Yeah, totally. A lot of if they are able to grow in that. Well, yeah, because you're not going to know everything, especially if something goes wrong with your birth or whatever, like- you know you're you're not like that's why we have people who have been through (laughs) birth a lot of times or it helped other people through birth but yeah that's great but like the people that are in the room and help Mm -hmm. you feel powerful is oh yeah yeah and again like the most it's like resilience (laughs) over um control yeah totally <laughs> like yeah. we don't have control <laughs> the yeah. childbirth experience so <laughs> um, we have a lot of influence potentially but no control and so being resilient and adaptive is such a better resource than you know having done all of the perfect correct things leading up to that moment because sure. when our bodies take over they take over you know there's certain points of kind of like no return or or even like medically thinking like oh man like I'm having this complication 
that's not my fault <laughs> that I could not have prepared for and being able to like surrender to that reality and also still feel strong and resilient yeah. is huge. great. <laughs> like yeah. Being able to hold on to both of those things, it has a huge impact on someone. Yeah. And I mean, definitely that I would probably say carries through throughout parenting. Like the more you feel like <laughs> relationally, you can, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. There's so many decisions in parenting that like, you, yeah, you know, and you're not going to be the perfect parent every day. No, I'm not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that ability to accept reality and feel whatever types of way you need to feel about it. And then like make a choice moving forward about what you do have power over and what you would like to do to interact with this new reality. Um, I mean, it's so good because you're parenting yourself and this is also a great way to parent your kids you yeah. know, to help them acknowledge like, oh my gosh, I'm experiencing something I don't like or whatever. And I'm feeling destabilized and then being able to like parachute into that moment with them and being like, yes, totally. Like I get that rather than it being like, no, you shouldn't feel this way or like you shouldn't like it's your fault that reality did this thing to you or whatever, you know, being able to be like, we have big feelings and then we can like process them and then make choices based off of that reality. Love it. So helpful. Um, okay. Well, kind of as we get to like closer to the end of time, is there anything that we like missed or anything like with parenting or that family relationship dynamic that we like missed or you feel like you wanted to touch on or? Yeah. I mean, I think just since we did end up spending a lot of time with like the transition yeah. into becoming new parents yeah. <laughs> or adding a new kid, <clears throat> I would just like suggest that the ability to do this individual re like regulation and parenting mm -hmm. yourself is like the ticket for surviving those early months of like sleeplessness because we are all lower functioning when we are on low sleep you know yeah. so like this skill and this resource is going to be able to combat <clears throat> some of the feelings of like oh I I'm spinning out of control <laughs> and like all of that that's normal with lack of sleep but I think being able to identify recognize the feelings that you're feeling and emerge from that reflection with a sense not perfect but like a sense of maybe what you need to be able to care for yourself or to care for your kid or care for your relationship, that ability to digest an emotion and then make a choice based off of that is going to be like magic <laughs> for you in the way that you feel through those early months. And then also mm. the way that your partner, whether you're the male or the female in this relationship, the way that your partner is able to support you mm -hmm. as you are going through different things. So being able to ask for I think what I actually just need is like sit outside in quiet for like 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Can you give that to me? You know, <laughs> like if you can like sort through your feelings and produce like a self-care intervention for yourself and ask for it, you're going to have all of these like moments interspersed through those months where you're coming up for air and you're mm -hmm. able to ground yourself. Remember that you're going to be okay. Remember <laughs> that this is not your permanent state forever for the rest of your life. Um, but if you don't have that skill set, then it's going to be a lot more difficult and you'll be tempted to like mentally check out and like power through and just be like, my emotions don't matter. Like, we're just going to like, here we go. Like grind it out <laughs> kind yeah. of mentality um, or just like crumbling constantly because you keep falling back into that place of like, I'm at rock bottom, but I don't really know what I need. Um, yeah. And so I would just like highly recommend to anyone who's like pregnant and expecting to start practicing this with your partner now of yeah. like, Hey, like start <laughs> like taking three to five minutes a day and just thinking about how you've been feeling. And it's weird if you're not used to doing this, yeah. <laughs> it's just like reflecting and like, what is going on? Am I like feeling really joyful about where we're at? Or I'm feeling really stressed today. And like, what is a good response to each of those different emotions? Um, and this will also increase like your connection with your partner mm -hmm. <laughs> during the yeah. early months, which is like one of the number one things that people talk about suffers pretty dramatically um, during those early months and even years. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd like use this analogy of like thinking of your relationship as like a bank account 
that you just or like an investment account where it's like you don't you're not going to be able to like put massive amounts of dollars in this account in this season of your marriage it's not likely but you can keep your account open <laughs> like do not <laughs> close the account <laughs> like you have to keep making small investments very small like week by week to keep that account open and it's not going to be experiencing exponential growth during those early seasons but it's going to be there and it's going to be active and it's going to be working when you do have more space and time to return to that connection with your partner and to spending more time together and that sort of stuff. So use time to your advantage you know, of like, oh, I don't have to be perfect in my relationship right now um, yeah. or, or ever, but yeah, especially right now and just being like, I'm playing this long game of yeah. like, we're going to freaking be here when our kids are 18 and they're yeah. leaving, you know, and like, we're going to continue to value and prioritize each other, even if it's only in small ways during these early seasons. Um, and I just think that, that can really change our perspective of like, oh, I'm investing in this thing that's going to generate like a whole lot for us down the road. It may not feel wonderful and magical right now, but being like, no, we have a life, we have a life together. Yeah, and we're gonna ensure that that's the case <laughs> by continuing to make little investments now. So, I love so yeah, that. those are like two like big leading into and postpartum things, like that emotional regulation and like those little tiny investments with your partner that kind of help stabilize and ground a family as they move through transition. That's beautiful. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there so? How do people like? work with you and follow you figure out more about your business yeah um so I'm very tragically unavailable on social media um I am not in a phase of life where I have much investment in that space I'm also about to have a baby next month so I'm in like toddler baby mode um and that is not my biggest priority but you can like connect with me or if you're you know one of you guys are like seeking counseling or therapy for yourself, your family, your you and your partner, um, you can go to daybreakfamilytherapy.com. That's my website. Or you can look up my name on Psychology Today and learn more about what I do and what I offer as far as services. Um, but yeah, I don't have like a whole lot of like additional workshops or trainings available right now um, in this season. So, yeah. but also like just in general, like if any of your kind of like followers have like questions or like follow up so I'm like also I'll like just chat with you <laughs> like I don't That's it doesn't so have to be like an official therapy session you know like I love talking about this stuff and so anyone that's like wanting clarity on something we talked about today it's like just reach out email me you know kind of a thing perfect we'll put your website and stuff um <laughs> in the show notes <laughs> in the comments <laughs> in the comments <laughs> great uh, yeah thank you so much Morgan that's perfect yeah yeah Thank you for having me. This is fun. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. We will talk later. Okay.